Now, what the Re Reagan revolution has been is to get the pendulum, you know, as it swings over to the right and then weld it shut with the laws, with the judges, with the control of the government. Now, the key has been, in their planning, has been a war. A war, you have a national, you know, security emergency. Uh, you, you can declare martial law. You can take emergency measures in war that you can't uh, argue in peacetime. Damage that has been done economically, uh, 50 years, maybe we will dig ourselves out of this, out of this debt out of the, the balance, maybe, maybe. But this flawed personality, apparently uh, dating back to the childhood with the, the abusive alcoholic father who, who, who could not give him an image to live up to and at the same time emasculated him with abuse. So you have Reagan's own autobiography. The theme of it is this haunting sense of, of inadequacy that has driven him all his life. And that's the theme of the book. And the title he took from one of his movies is Where's the Rest of Me? And this, you know, is, is being cited by the psychological studies that are coming out now as, as why he would have this craving for military power. The Reagan Revolution comes under the close scrutiny of John Stockwell, former CIA official, right now on Alternative Views. Hello, welcome to Alternative Views. We're going to have a talk today with John Stockwell about the Reagan Revolution, in which we'll look at Reagan's attempt to revolutionize foreign policy and to change the direction of U.S. policy in this area. We'll discuss with John what the Reagan Revolution in foreign policy was, what impact and effects it had, and where it stands now with the Iran-Contra scandals. But before we have our interview with John Stockwell, here are some news stories that are relevant to our subject tonight. Another story came out over the weekend that points to the secret team Nexus as the apparatus that's behind the whole Iran-Contra scandals. The story that was reported first in U.S. News and World Report and that hit the AP and UP wire services this weekend indicated that Oliver North wanted to assassinate Iranian officials. The story was leaked to a U.S. military personnel who told the uh, U.S. News and World Report writers about this that North had told them that there was a plan underway to assassinate the Ayatollah Khomeini and other Islamic fundamentalist officials in Iran to try to eliminate them. Again, this points to the secret team because this was the strategy all throughout the Vietnam era in the 1970s that Richard Secord, John Singlaub, North, and their associates used to eliminate political opposition that they wanted to get rid of. In Vietnam, there was the famous uh, Phoenix program that involved assassinations of different leaders in Vietnam that the administration, the U.S. administration, wanted to get rid of, and Secord was involved in that. There were allegations by the Christic Institute that throughout the 1970s, Secord and other CIA personnel were involved in assassinations of Iranian officials at that time. 
uh, rather Iranian democratic opposition to the Shah. And there was also claims that Secord and the secret team went up to Samosa just before his downfall and offered for a good price to assassinate the Sandinista leaders. So North Secord and these people for decades have been involved in political assassinations of opposition leaders. This is a story that John Stockwell broke on our story on our show, Alternative Views, and that he's tried to get this into the New York Times and LA Times as an op ed piece so far without uh, success. You know, other elements of the establishment of press, but not the the core establishment press people, have been doing some good work on, on this uh, subject. Uh, Newsweek on June 8th, this is reported in The Guardian, uh, Newsweek reported that the anti sandinista Nicaragua Catholic Church uh, reactionary cardinal, uh, Miguel Abande Bravo, actually was receiving over $100,000 from the CIA, or at least they said he may have received $100,000 from uh, 19, uh, uh, until 1985. The uh, GAO, the General Accounting Office, found his name on a signature card in the Grand Caymans Island Bank in the account used by the CIA and the Contras. And then what happened when they found that out, they, uh, they stopped paying him directly and Oh, Oliver North picked up the flag <laughs> to give the, give the uh, old Miguel Ubando y Brava what he had coming to him. I have some stories from the uh, Tico Times of uh, <laughs> San uh, Jose, Costa Rica that my cousin who lives there uh, sent me that had some very, very interesting um, stories. Here on Alternative Views, we had an in-depth analysis with the uh, Christic Institute about a bombing in uh, La Penca, Nicaragua, several uh, years ago that's part of the whole Iran-Contra scandal of the Reagan administration that has not come out yet at all in the uh, U.S. Uh, media. I haven't read one line about the La Penca bombing or heard anything about it on uh, television, whereas in the Tico Times on the third anniversary of this uh, bombing, they have a several page in-depth story and a lot of related stories. What happened three years ago in La Penca was that Eden Pastora was having a press conference where he was going to denounce the uh, other Contra leaders who were refusing to democratize their forces. Pastora was one of the heroes of the Sandinista revolution in Nicaragua, who was one of the first Sandinista leaders to break with the uh, Ortega regime and to go into exile. And he was trying to link up with the other Contra leaders to have a united front. But Pastora was requiring that the other uh, Contras get rid of some of the uh, tortures from the Somoza regime and some of the uh, terrorists that were involved in the uh, Contra activities, uh, but the other Contras did not want to go along with uh, Pastora, so it was alleged that they decided to assassinate Pastora, and when he was having this uh, press conference in La Penca, a bomb went off that killed uh, several um, journalists and that uh, was going to be blamed on the Sandinista regime. Well, none of this has really come out in the U.S. Uh, press, but investigations since then indicate that none other than Richard uh, Secord and his group provided the explosives to a terrorist who set the bomb at the uh, La Penca um, site. And it also came out um, in this um, article that there was a big division over Pastora in the Reagan administration where people like uh, Singlaub said it was absolutely essential for the uh, Contras to work with Pastora, whereas people like uh, Oliver North and Secord said that Pastora was impossible, he was uh, too uh, democratic, he was too idealist, and the other Contra leaders could never work with him or get along with him, and so they had to be um, eliminated. Um, this story in the Tico Times also uh, points out that uh, John Hall, um, who's the American rancher who has CIA uh, connections in uh, Costa Rica, admits for the first time 
that he uh, aided um, the rebels there. According to this uh, story, the explosives that were used to bomb uh, Pastora were uh, brought by North and Secor in their connections to John Hall's uh, ranch, and that Hall got these uh, explosives um, to the terrorists who attempted to uh, assassinate uh, Pastora. It was also alleged that it was John Hall's ranch in Costa Rica that uh, was the drug connection site where the uh, U.S. planes uh, landed to uh, bring uh, weapons and materials to the Contras and then picked up drugs on uh, Hall's ranch and flew them back to the U.S. Mainly cocaine? Cocaine, marijuana, heroin, a whole variety of um, drugs. Well, once these stories uh, broke, Hall finally decided that he would admit, yes, he was an arms supplier for the Contras, yes, he aided the rebels, he had connections, but he denied the drug uh, connection. Uh -huh. <laughs> so he wanted to admit the uh, lesser charges, the country uh, <laughs> connection, in order to uh, deny the uh, larger uh, charges that he uh, provided explosives to try to assassinate uh, Pastora and uh, was also involved in the drug connection. Christian Science Monitor had a story in which they uh, had a, a lengthy analysis of the CIA's largely unexamined role, at least by the Congress, of gun running operation. Now, the inconclusive argument over the applicability of the Boland Amendment, as far as North and CIA and Secord were concerned, would turn out to be irrelevant if the CIA itself was the center of the Contra arming operation. The um, Christian Science Monitor also said that there was another guy in the CIA who is actually running things for the CIA Central American Task Force, and he is responsible within the CIA, and he's one up in the ladder from Oliver North. This guy's name is Alan Fears, or Fires, F-I-E-R-S, and uh, the monitor quoted a guy that said, uh, an anonymous North American source, that says, that everyone imagines that Ollie North was top dog of the Contra effort. What they don't realize is that to begin with, this was basically a CIA show, and secondly, most of the time, Fears, who is much slyer than North, was able to manipulate Ollie into what he wanted. Being the dupe. In the Have you ever thing. heard that name before? I've never I, I had Have seen you? that in one or two New York Times stories, but he's not widely known mm -hmm. as um, a major player in here. I think one of the big points of, the, of this whole thing a lot of us tend to think, well, this all came in with the Reagan administration. They're just a bunch of thugs. They like to live <laughs> above, they think they're above the law, et cetera. But as some of these re revelations show, this has been going on for a long time. Uh, there were people in the CIA and without during the Carter administration working to dump Carter and try, uh, uh, actually establishing our foreign policy. And this has been going on for decades now. Speaking of CIA operations and political assassinations under the Reagan administration, some fairly interesting stories have come out recently about events in Panama over the last seven years. One of our viewers, Dennis Lawson of Austin, sent us several different articles that make a very interesting juxtaposition, starting with an article from June the, uh, or August the 2nd, 1981, that reports on how Panamanian strongman General Omar Torrios had been killed in an airplane crash in Panama. Torrios was the gentleman in Panama that negotiated with Jimmy Carter the Panama Canal Treaty that would give the Panama Canal back to Panama in the 1990s. And Torrio was a big uh, populist who was friends with uh, Fidel Castro and who said in the article um, after his death that the two people he admired most were Jimmy Carter, who had shown courage in negotiating this uh, Panama Canal Treaty with him, and Fidel Castro, who he thought was a, a brilliant political uh, leader. Just the sort of uh, people that the Reagan administration would not um, like. 
Well, the plane of Mr. Trujillo crashed, and the day after the crash, there was a UPI story that has headlines, Trujillo's body returned, rolled by CIA alleged. So from the very beginning, it was alleged that the CIA was responsible for the explosion of the plane that killed uh, General uh, Trujillo's during the first year of the uh, Reagan administration. Well, just this week, there have been a series of demonstrations in Panama against the uh, strongman General Noriga, who had took, uh, who took over after the death of uh, Trios. And there's been demonstrations from all sectors of Panama society against him in the last uh, week or two. Well, one of the most explosive revelations comes from the retired military chief of staff, Colonel Ro Robert Diaz Herrera, who says that he has firsthand information that indeed the CIA was involved in blowing up the airplane that killed General Torrios, and he, uh, he claims, this is the claim of uh, General Diaz of Panama, that Noriga conspired with General Wallace Nutting, who was then the head of the U.S. Uh, Southern um, Command in Panama and the CIA to blow up uh, the aircraft that Troyos was using and that they gave him a, um, um, an explosive that was put on the plane to um, blow it up. Well, it's just one of those many little minor assassinations that the CIA has been involved in over the years. Boys will be boys. Right? Nothing new. Nothing new. Now let's have our interview with John Stockwell, former high CIA official who was in that agency for 13 years before quitting and writing his famous book In Search of Enemies. Tonight he evaluates the Reagan revolution for us. John, welcome to Alternative Views. Once again, for my about pleasure. About the, what, 30th time? <laughs> <laughs> Best television program in the nation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, we've watched the uh, Reagan foreign policy now for the last seven years. We've had you on many times to discuss this. What is distinctive about Reagan's foreign policy? What did he try to do different from his predecessors? Well, he set out 30 years ago to effect a major lasting change on the United States political system, a radical change. And he pursued it to get himself into the White House to effect this change. And he's done it to a degree, <laughs> perhaps not to, you know, he hasn't iced the cake, certainly not the way he hoped. The Aronimuk thing has dis deflected and, and his own corruption or the corruption around him. But no other president in history I don't believe can make a case of, of setting out as a, a middle-aged man to effect a dramatic change on this society and come as close as this man has. And what is the nature of this change? Well, first you have to understand and accept, which is hard for some, but you read the man's biography, the, and we know him well. He's been a public figure for four or five decades, radio announcer and then politician, activist in, in Hollywood. He has never been a conservative with a small c. He has always been drawn to radical activities and uh, propensity towards uh, right-wing radical activities, even when he was posing uh, as a, a, a liberal a protector of the people who were being blacklisted from the Screen Actors Guild and whatnot. He was, in fact, cooperating as a friend with the House uh, um, an American Affairs Committee and with uh, Richard Nixon's red-baiting vicious political campaign in California. Then you see other indications when he was governor the San Diego Navy Assassination School which was teaching very heavy techniques of torture and killing. Uh, he was this under the CIA? No, this was the U.S. Navy. A Navy killer oh school God. in San Diego. When was this? And this was in the late 60s. <coughs> Reagan, Reagan was governor of California. You bet. And Reagan was uh, was honoring them and, and mentioning them and going to call them. You bet. Oh, wow. you he bet. loves the military for some reason. He has an absolute fascination with military action and personnel and ships and weapons. And power and control. Uh, second thing you can cite uh, was this California Special Training Institute that we've mentioned before. 
at San Luis Obispo in 1969. It began with Operation, uh, what was it called, Cable Splicer, Cable Splicer yeah. uh, with Luis Giofrida putting it together with uh, generals from the, the Pentagon and the National Guard, as well as corporate executives assembling for a seminar to discuss techniques of, of population control, repression, heavy-duty stuff, the disinformation, the torture, the planning informants, the phony groups, the concentration uh, camps, uh, the concentration then, camps, the curfews, the martial law, uh, all of these techniques. And Reagan gave the opening address to the seminar, the secret, they all wore civilian clothes so, you know, the, the media wouldn't. And he gave the opening address and his words were something to the effect, you know, there are some people in the state who if they could see us all assembled here today would say that their worst fears are being recognized that I'm planning a military takeover. And then this thing, under his encouragement, proceeded to become the California Special Training Institute and continues so that by 1979, UPI reported that it had graduated 14,000 people. And mind you, that's mm -hmm. 14,000 generals and admirals and executives. From foreign countries as well as the From United States. From foreign countries as well. And this is coordinated, with, as you said, with corporations, with the uh, uh, communications apparatus in the United States. Bell Telephone Company mm -hmm. prominently. And with the police apparatus, the with FBI, the CIA. Police and officers. And local locals as well. Police officers and sheriffs being brought in from all over the nation mm -hmm. to be briefed on these techniques and associate you know, creating a, a, a police cult, if you will. Mm -hmm. Now, so Reagan proceeds to get himself elected president with the help of the people that he was fronting for. But, you know, it's his, right. it's his program, too. It isn't just that they made him. It's what he's been working for, and they've joined with him. And he comes into office promising uh, to effect the Reagan Revolution and to permanently change the society. Now, he has told us many, many times what he would have done if he had been president during the Vietnam War. And he wasn't bluffing. His, uh, his attitude towards dissidents in California during the war, you know, if there has to be a bloodbath, let's get it over with. And he wasn't bluffing. He called out the National Guard and gave them orders to shoot to kill. And then he comes into the, the White House. One element of the revolution is to shatter the government, to gain control of it by breaking it down putting in his own people, very radical people, who would smash it, who would break up the bureaucracy and all the little relationships and everything. You know, James Watt, uh, Ann Burford, for example, Elliot Abrams. Uh, he was put, you remember, uh, in charge of the Human Rights Division of the State Department, sending the files back to the countries in question, and then the Immigration Naturalization Service sending the people back to the countries as well. I mean, this is, these are heavy duty. These people are playing uh, hardball. It's a revolution to them. That's what they call it. Uh, Alfred Regnery, you know, this have you socked your kid today. That was his bumper sticker, put in charge of the juvenile division of the Justice Department. Have you socked your kid today? Yeah. The guy, his, his pediatrician went to Washington to testify to the committees saying you can never put this man in a job where he has to deal with young people. I know because I treat his family. And he was nominated for the juvenile division of the Justice Department. And you know, you know there, hundreds, are, yeah. there, are, there are parallel things. You look at the National Labor Relations Board stacked against the union. You look at the health organizations where they're going, they're going to have uh, ketchup for uh, mm -hmm. a vegetable. Mm -hmm. uh, all the way through the government, like you say. Breaking uh, the liberal mindset. Uh, you know, of the government, and and then throughout trying to pass laws that would reinforce. I mean, a lot of laws we get are, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers making a law about the environment in some locale, and it's a law. It's enforced by the judges, even though the Congress never voted on it. Agencies applying law, presidential orders setting up laws, lots of laws he's passed. Uh, but in addition to that, this 45 percent of the judges uh, that he's appointed, the federal judges, almost half that he's managed to appoint since he's been in office. Now, this right radical. Right radical. Hey, crazy. People oh, like William nuts. Rehnquist, a documented racist and bigot as the, at the top of the Supreme Court. And, and Daniel Mannion, you know, this illiterate attorney, can't write a paper. The son of a John Birch Society founder made a judge. People like that. So that when they get this, when they get the test of the revolution, when they, when they pull it together, they will have done all of their homework, all of the spade work, the preparation, uh, will have been done so that they can make it stick. Now, what the Re Reagan revolution has been is to get the pendulum, you know, as it swings over to the right and then weld it shut. 
with the laws, with the judges, with the control of the government. Now, the key has been, in their planning, has been a war. A war, you have a national, you know, security emergency. Uh, you, you can declare martial law. You can take emergency measures in war that you can't uh, argue in peacetime. And this is where they were heading towards the invasion of Nicaragua. And it was derailed by the, not just the Iran-Contra scandal, although that definitely derailed it or postponed it, but also the break apart of the Reagan machine. There was just so much corruption. He had too many incompetent wild men running the thing for him, dealing with people like Oliver North, when he should have had the Carluccis in there to begin with, who, who would do about the same thing, but more credibly, more, more, more soberly, more sane, and more, with more credibility in the establishment. He was beginning to come apart last fall before the Iran-Contra thing uh, crashed, uh, brought him down to a point. Now the big question that we, we debate everywhere, I debate it everywhere, I discuss it with the Daniel Ellsbergs and David McMichaels as I travel, and lots of other people, is whether or not he will succeed in invading Nicaragua. And that's a horror unto itself. But I have the feeling that people miss the broader implications of this invasion when it happens. Now, the Christic Institute, this flawed affidavit, it has a, seg a segment on the Rex 84, the detention mm -hmm. centers, the FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, which is part of this plan, uh, which is to, to prepare detention centers and laws uh, and an infrastructure across the country so that when they pull off the invasion, they will be able to, to, to sweep 400,000 people off the streets and throw them in detention centers. Now, this one, I asked the, the FEMA people, the, the sober uh, ones there, uh, if they really had this documented. Because we talked about this Rex 84 two or three years ago, and the spotlight had mentioned it, but the, it, it wasn't really proven. And uh, they assured me, they said, yes, they have this one from top attorneys within FEMA who have admitted to it, and they got it documented. Plus, they have all the laws from 1950 still on the books. The McCarran Act, which sets up concentration camps, and all the special powers which the president has, where he can declare a, an emergency at any time without getting anybody's approval, and putting all these things into effect, taking over the banking system, transportation system, the uh, broadcasting system, and mm -hmm. incarcerating okay. everybody. <laughs> I, I think there's another aspect of this desire to invade Nicaragua, and that was the would be the crowning blow of the Reagan Revolution, the fulfillment of it. I think that in this Iran-Contra hearings, we've been seeing all of the anti-communism of these people that were involved in the North Network and in the Reagan foreign policy apparatus, who literally believed in the domino theory that if Nicaragua and El Salvador, quote unquote, weren't communist, then that would be a domino effect going through Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico to the United States, and we would face a communist takeover of this country. He came into office promising, you know, the, the Grenada, Nicaragua, and Cuba. Uh, and he, he did, you know, after the Grenada thing, they had bumper stickers out, Nicaragua next. Mm. Al Haig, now Cuba's a tougher nut. Mm. It's, it's better defended. They can't do it. The cost, I talk to these admirals up in Washington often enough, and they continuously reassure me that our Pentagon, no president here is foolish enough to try to pull off an invasion of Cuba. Not that we couldn't win, but it would be so bloody and so expensive, and there would be uh, so much uh, damage done. It would be fought in part in the United States. I mean, we would, you know, we would obliterate Cuba, but the Cubans would take a toll in our own cities here, and no politician could survive that. You know, John, we've been, as part of the Reagan administration, we've been talking about foreign policy. That's our emphasis. Though I think we should briefly also talk about the economic aspects of the Reagan Revolution, which also have been very successful from his point of view. The severe weakening of the labor unions and the working class institutions that have been developed since the 1930s, the lowering of the standard of living of most Americans, a tremendous transfer of wealth and income from the middle and lower classes up to the upper classes. But at the same time, he seriously destabilized the economy of the United States by being such a great adherent of free marketism and deregulation. 
it has particularly caused chaos in the banking and investment industry where these corporate raiders have come in and seriously destabilized the economy. So although he, it, it's been a two-edged sword, but nonetheless, he has carried out the Reagan revolution in this aspect too. There's another element where the economics impact on foreign policy and the other issues we've discussed, and that's the military buildup. The Reagan administration has spent two trillion dollars on weapons since coming into office. The whole cost of Vietnam, according to some analyses that I've read, was one trillion dollars. So Reagan has spent twice as much as was spent on the entire Vietnam episode from the early 60s to the mid-70s simply in a military weapons buildup and has done this without raising taxes and has thus built up the biggest deficit in history. Without being an economist, I read and watch these things since, you know, since George Bush called it voodoo economics. Uh, the, the deficit uh, rendering the United States non-competitive the way he has done, uh, and we were already headed in that direction, he has applied the same irresponsibility to economics that he's applied to breaking up the government, the Alfred Regnery syndrome, the Elliot, Elliot Abrams type of appointment. Uh, this is where his position in history, uh, as David McMichael was telling me over the phone last night, he said the next president, be he Democrat or, or Republican, is going to be a, a Herbert Hoover. Yes. He's going to preside over a gigantic collapse. Now, how big this collapse will be, nobody knows. But the damage that has been done economically, uh, 50 years, maybe we will dig ourselves out of this, out of this debt, out of the, the balance. Maybe, maybe. And, and at the other end of the line, Lloyd Dumas, you know, in his, his book he brought out last year, the article he ran at the New York Times is, is a, a s slow decline or sudden collapse. But his, his thesis in this book is that this, this madness of Reaganomics, when we were already not competitive, has put us on the slide down. And it's, we're, we are sliding down, and unless we dramatically reverse our, our, the arms race, essentially, the military-industrial complex control, uh, we're going down as a, as a superpower. We'll go down into secondary uh, national status uh, if we slide, if we don't crash. So these are expensive fantasies that uh, Reagan uh, has, which also we haven't mentioned was his early desire to destroy the Soviet Union. It seems that he really had the fantasy of eradicating the evil empire. He really was pursuing the option very seriously of a nuclear weapons buildup that would enable him to carry out a first strike policy and eliminate the Soviet Union or to create such military nuclear superiority that he could dictate to the Soviet Union because they would be afraid of his military power. And I think this is also behind the Star Wars. With this flawed person, the, 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 the individual with, uh, I mean, I've, you know, I've said since 83 in my lectures, you know, pointing out his defective mind, which is, which is obvious and now so obvious that I scarcely even bother because everyone realizes <laughs> that, you know, he simply can't keep up with things. He's had this drive, this dream, this, this radical bent that would effect a revolution, but not a kind of intellect that could really weave a revolution together. Uh, but this flawed personality, apparently uh, dating back to the childhood with the, the abusive alcoholic father who, who, who could not give him an image to live up to and at the same time emasculated him with abuse. So you have Reagan's own autobiography. The theme of it is this haunting sense of, of inadequacy that has driven him all his life. And that's the theme of the book. And the title he took from one of his movies is Where's the Rest of Me? And this, you know, is, is being cited by the psychological studies that are coming out now as, as why he would have this craving for military power, you know, to be complete, to be strong. Why he could be so offended by petty world leaders like Gaddafi, uh, for example, uh, who, who, you know, would discredit themselves. Uh, you, uh, a more complete person wouldn't get involved in the arguments with them. And he has, he has continuously gotten down to the same level of petty name-calling with them, of, of, of threatening or wanting, expressing his desire to make Daniel Ortega cry uncle. 
and you know, I mean, the bullying aspect of it. You would have to have someone with a, the bully syndrome, with a very inadequate personality, who would crave to make a Daniel Ortega in a poor country like Nicaragua cry uncle. And this, you know, taking it into the Reaganomics, into the Star Wars, wanting to control the world, wanting mm -hmm. to be able to crush his enemies, it's a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous combination. Does Hollywood play any role in this? Hollywood movies over the last 40 years have projected this fantasy that the world is divided into good and evil. There's us and them, the good guys, the bad guys. We're absolutely good, they're absolutely evil. They are so evil that if we don't eradicate them, just eliminate them through violence, they're gonna get us. Do you think this contributes to Reagan's mentality that he identified with these Hollywood roles and this view of the world? Or do you think it's sort of deeper psychological roots? Oh, it's, it's all part, it's deeper psychologically, but it's also a very, it's the American syndrome in television, the cultural, uh, the game that we put on to our kids from the age of two, that they watch 10 or 20 times a day on television, the little shorty uh, cartoons where you have nice, handsome, light-colored, uh, hero figures, be they Transformers, you know, and Decepticons, uh, or the the He-Man, Sheena, the Thundercats, you know, I'm, I'm into these things because of little Jonathan. Uh, but always the nice people and the evil forces rising up and the nice people saying, let's all be nice, but the evil forces insisting and forcing, and then the good guy is stomping them and beating them down. But interestingly enough, to keep the syndrome going for the little kids, Skeletor, you know, never is killed. He changes form and disappears so he can come back ne the next day and do it again. Now, we brainwash our kids, uh, like I say, 10 or 20 times a day with this, the American syndrome. Nice people being put upon by evil and, and going. Would you, would you re do you realize there is a country in this hemisphere that does not permit violent shows to be shown on television for children? Nicaragua? No, it's Cuba. Cuba. Yeah. Cuba. They do not permit violent kid shows on television. Mm. They believe it's psychologically unhealthy, <laughs> and we do nothing but. Mm. Uh, assuming the Democrats or even another Republican gets in next time, is how, has he done so much damage that they're going to able to put it back together again? Or, as we well know, he couldn't have done it without the Democrats' collusion in the House and Senate. So just where do we go after Reagan's out? Well, this is a possible explanation of why this democratically controlled Senate is not doing a better job investigating the Iran-Contra thing. This Reagan, who has bedeviled them for so many years now, they have him. All, all they have to do is start asking the questions, and they can rip this thing wide apart and have him impeached, and they're not interested. And my suggestion is... The, the Reagan revolution is not a Republican revolution, it's the establishment's revolution. It's getting the pendulum over here and welding it shut for the benefit of the multinationals, the military-industrial complex, of which the Democrats are just as much a part as the Republicans. Now, he has supervised a tremendous arms buildup, but remember Jimmy Carter, you know, supervised a huge arms buildup, and so did Harry Truman, for just a cite to, not to mention Lyndon Johnson. And Carter also presided over a tax cut, or a tax benefit for the wealthy at the expense of the middle East. Indeed, of and so they don't want to throw out the, the whole revolution. They don't want to sacrifice Reagan and cast the country, throw the country back into a populist mode. There's been a tremendous shift of wealth under Mr. Reagan, I'm quoting now from Chomsky's turning the tide and, and writing the shift of wealth and power to the elite at the expense of the people. Wealth and power, the political power, the, the ketchup and, and uh, relish thing in the schools, you know, just the whole rationale of society, the dynasty uh, and Dallas thing, you know, the rich, rich and glittery uh, taking over. They don't want to lose that. The satisfaction they would get out of impeaching Reagan uh, isn't worth it because they would lose his revolution, which is gains for for their 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 level, their strata of society, their power level, and their social class, and their social yeah. class. You know, the establishment, the military-industrial complex. One of the keys to understanding the Reagan administration is understanding its relationships with the religious right. Many of whose adherents are high officials in the Reagan administration, including Reagan himself. We've referred to particular sections of this Covert Action Information Bulletin. Uh, 
edition of, let's see, what's that? Um, number 27? Anyway, it's the latest one, I guess something like July or June. It tells all you want to know, almost all you want to know about the religious right, and it's incredible, incredible what, how, not only what some of these people believe, but how they're organized among themselves and their interrelationships with the United States government and corporate America. Uh, they're not just these weirdos who, you know, hoop and holler and rant and rave on, on television. As a matter of fact, uh, according to Robertson's uh, Christian Broadcasting Network, they say the bulk of their contributions actually come from the big corporations in the United States. But the religious right is a complex coalition, according to Larry Hickam, who's been studying this for some time. Uh, it's a complex coalition of independent organizations ranging from those well-known that we've been talking about and wealthy international, with wealthy international television networks like CBN, to smaller uh, organizations with just a few TV stations or small network here and there. But they also are interlocked with, as I said, corporate America and the government. For instance, there are many, many organizations which they form. One particularly is called the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International. Now, these are all fundamentalists, uh, including a hodgepodge of charismatics and, and uh, all that type, Pentecostals. And these, in some parts of the country, particularly in the Sunbelt State, this organization, uh, the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship, called the FGB, MFI. It seemed like they could come up with a better acronym than that. Anyway, they're made up largely of people who manage the military-industrial complex. President Reagan has close ties with the organization, and a lot of his top advisors are uh, from this organization. And they're, uh, you know, they believe in the Armageddon and the Second Coming, and we're in the last days and all like that. So, they, these people have meetings from time to time. Some of them are low-key or informal. Some of them are more highly organized. But they have breakfasts where, breakfasts where they talk about uh, the coming of Jesus and uh, how nuclear weapons will lead to the second coming of Jesus. Yeah. And so uh, and so many of these people see there's a difference. The people who believe in the rapture, the, some of them who believe that they're going to be raptured, you know, taken up to heaven, before just before the Big Bang. So they're not sweating World War III at all. They don't care. And some of these people are in high in the government and, as I said, just involved in the military-industrial complex and even working with nuclear weapons systems. Now, there are other people who believe in the rapture. They believe that they're going to fry a while, suffer a little bit, <laughs> before they're raptured. And then Robertson feels that they'll go through the whole thing, but uh, God will kind of take it easy on them, protect them a bit from it. The good guys. Yeah. So as the... The uh, person here says he wrote the article, the idea that a key network of key workers in the military-industrial complex, along with others who are key decision makers in a nuclear chain of command, may all be, you know, have these expectations of Armageddon and how great it's going to be, makes you kind of worry a bit. <laughs> Well, there's something even more uh, worrisome about this whole thing, and that is that Ronald Reagan himself believes in yeah. the rapture and uh, Armageddon. There's an article in some uh, cultural journal that I saw that indicates that at 12 different occasions, Reagan has spoken seriously about the uh, rapture and his belief that uh, nuclear war might possibly be the Armageddon that had been predicted in uh, Revelations. And at this time, the good people like him and Jerry Falwell would uh, ascend to heaven while the rest of us would uh, fly. This is particularly scary as we move into the last year or so of the Reagan administration because if a tenth of the stories that we've been reporting on alternative views are true concerning the scandals in the Iran-Contra affair and the entire Reagan administration, there's been nothing but a series of one crimes after another. If all of these stories break in the mass uh, media, there's no question but that Reagan will be impeached. So the frightening scenario is that just as he's about to go, he decides that uh, we'll all go together when we go, as Tom Lehrer <laughs> used to sing in the 1950s, and it's time uh, for the rapture uh, to come and the buttons to uh, be pushed. So I hope that if there's an attempt to impeach 
Reagan, there's also someone that has a very close uh, look at the uh, nuclear weapons uh, buttons to keep the old guy from uh, blowing us all away as he goes out. Well, as the, this article continues, it talks about these people are, you know, just not a bunch of Ray, Reagan crazies. Here, so the Secretary of Defense built uh, two prayer rooms at the Pentagon. And they have these organized Bible study groups for admirals and uh, generals in the Pentagon, members of Congress and their aides. And here are some of the people who, who, are, who go to these prayer rooms at the Secretary of Defense. It's people like Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Commandant of the Marine Corps, Chief of Naval Operations, Chief of Staff of the Army. I mean, we're not talking about just a bunch of crazy underlings. We're talking about the big people who've got their fingers on the button up there. According to the religious right, Armageddon will occur as a result of a clash between the Soviet Union and the United States in the Middle East. Well, the situation in the Persian Gulf looms rather large and significant. John Stockwell gives his opinion. President Reagan has avoided uh, confrontation in the Gulf for, for six years now. They've been shooting up oil tankers, and that's terribly threatening. I mean, if, yeah. if our, you know, our leaders wanted some, that's the sort of thing. I mean, the Angolan operation, because the Soviets could theoretically put in a submarine base that would threaten the South Atlantic to cut off the flow of oil, you know, and the tankers coming up through the South Atlantic, that was the rationale that they've, they were using for that thing. And here we have countries that are actually strafing and shooting and sinking. Uh, oil tankers, and we've done nothing about it. And the reason, I submit, is geographical. Uh, can you imagine what Reagan would do if Nicaragua shot up an oil tanker, or if Grenada had, or, you know, our Q or some country, or, or Libya, if, if Gaddafi had ordered an oil tanker in the Mediterranean to be shot up? But the reason is that to fight a war way around on the backside, very hard to get to, very hard to resupply, very hard to get the American people, you know, deeply involved. Uh, and so they have avoided time after time a provocation, in addition to which they don't want to do anything to push Iran in the direction of the Soviet Union. The, the Soviets are no more happy with Khomeini than, you know, than we are. And uh, a, an open heavy-duty attack on, on Iran uh, could, could cost us the influence that we've had over the years in that country that's right on the Soviet border. Now, Mr. Reagan has clearly gotten involved, the provocations, putting our ships in there where they're right in the way where they could get shot up, and two of them have been attacked uh, in the Stark more dramatically, and then the huge focus of interest on the Stark. Y you people are drawing parallels in the question marks. The Marines in the barracks in Beirut in 1983 were not allowed to carry bullets in their guns. The ones guarding the, the barracks, you know, were not allowed to have armed weapons. Who ended up being killed oh, in yeah. bombings. And, and uh, you know, this is perfectly open. Now, we had intercepts that this barracks was going to be targeted, and they didn't take the precautions of putting the big concrete things so a truck going in would have to go like this, which would give you time to react and shoot out its tires. That it's very basic in a base like that. They left them exposed. And then you have this, this Stark over there uh, just not defending itself at all. Uh, so you have now, all of which is to say that they have clearly targeted, Reagan has clearly targeted the Gulf now. And uh, the obvious uh, purpose would be to get the world attention off of the hearings. Right. But I don't think he wants to get involved in a big war there. I think he wants some macho, and there may be some more missiles fired in different directions, maybe some bombing and whatnot, but I don't believe he wants to get involved in a war there. But he would like to be able to turn up the fire every now and then there to draw attention off over, over in Washington and the hearings. And God knows, yeah. maybe heat it up enough that he can eventually pull off the invasion of Nicaragua. I'm still, by the way, my, my wager macabre, sad, sick wager in 81 uh, that, the, that the United States would invade Nicaragua. And I have you not... You see that as more likely than a war in the uh, I, Gulf? Yeah, and I have not retracted yeah. that. I believe that Reagan is still trying very hard and uh, very likely will succeed. I have a little item here that was in the nation. Christopher Hitchens again, this time at the end of May. Uh, Ronald Reagan was speaking to the American Newspaper Publishers Association in May and said for the first time, quote, I do not intend to leave such a crisis for the next American president, 
unquote, and that was referring to the Sandinistas. This is in May now, and it was bolstered by the following peerless citation, quote, there was a line attributed to Lenin, the road to America leads through Mexico. This is, <laughs> here we go again. Oh, really? Yeah. In the fall of 85, Reagan had told oh, Ted Koppel God. of ABC that he's often quoted Lenin's statement that, quote, we will take Eastern Europe, we will organize the hordes of Asia, and then we will move into Latin America and we won't have to take the United States. It will fall into our outstretched hands like overripe fruit. Well, the Library of Congress reports that they've often been asked to find his quotation, <laughs> but they haven't been able to come up with a source for it. The White House press office had no idea who attributed this quotation to Lenin. And the Carly Meyer of the New York Times uh, was aroused. This came up again, so he started digging up, in, uh, digging, digging into it. Excuse me, and he came up with the Blue Book of the John Birch Society which was put together by the society's founder, Robert Welch, in 1958. And, and this is in the blue book, and I'm quoting from it, and on page 10, it, he, he says, said by Lenin, first we will take Eastern Europe, next the masses of Asia, then we shall encircle that last bastion of capitalism, the United States of America. We shall not have to attack, it will fall like overripe fruit into our hands. Well, he didn't have any source either, Welch didn't provide any, but, uh, as Christopher Hitchens concludes, an unsourced Birchite blue book is more than enough authority for Ronald Reagan. I have a couple of very short stories about the mind of uh, Ronald Reagan. Um, according to <laughs> the Washington sure. Post... This assuming there is one. Right. According to the Washington Post, uh, President Reagan's attempt at uh, conciliation with the Soviet Union in uh, Geneva and some arms talks in 1985 included a vow that the U.S. would join the Soviet Union in case the Earth was invaded by aliens from outer space. The United States assured the Russians that the U.S. would engage in a military uh, treaty and joint action uh, with them in case there were alien invasions, and I'm sure the Russians were uh, very uh, assured about uh, that. More recently, and not quite as funny as Ronald Reagan's uh, performance at the uh, recent uh, European uh, summit, you may have seen uh, Ron uh, dozing off during the uh, meetings and George Schultz uh, poking him to uh, wake him up. And you may have seen uh, Ron's uh, news conference where he couldn't quite get his answers right. Well, Anthony Lewis in the New York Times reports also that Ron had a group of his three by five index cards to prompt him for every single, every single thing he said during the whole summit, whereas the other um, leaders were engaging in dialogue and discussing with each other. Ron would just pull one uh, card after another out and uh, read them and then go back to uh, sleep. So this is fairly uh, serious uh, evidence about the deterioration of the already fairly enfeebled mind of uh, Reagan. I have something here that I've been hanging on to. It's from the June-July issue of Mother Jones, and it's entitled Amiable Dunce or Chronic Liar. And basically what it is, is it gives you an overview of some of the Ronald Reagan's quotes during his uh, reign. And really, this is just a cursory look at this, because, I mean, there have been books written about this before. Uh, I'd like to read you a few of the quotes that Ronald Reagan has disgorged during his administration. Look back in fondness at some of the uh, slip-ups. For instance... Following a half-hour lecture by the Lebanese foreign minister on the intricate realities of his country's many political faction, Ron said, quote, You know, your nose looks just like Danny Thomas's. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. When he visited McDonald's for a photo opportunity, opportunity during the fall 84 election campaign, Reagan asked aides, What am I supposed to order? Uh, another one. Uh, the Reagan White House grew contemptuous of the compliant media. For example, when shown that Reagan had cited a non-existent British law to disparage gun control, Press Secretary Larry, Larry Speaks responded, Well, it made the point, didn't it? And Chief of Staff Donald Reagan last year referred to himself with bravado as the Shovel Brigade, cleaning up after the President's elephantine blunderings of Bitburg, Reykjavik, and the Libyan disinformation campaign. Okay, here's another example. He said, quote, with me, abortion is not a problem of religion. It's a problem of the Constitution. I believe that until and unless someone can establish that the unborn child is not a living human being, then that child is already protected by the Constitution, which guarantees life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to all of us. 
Now, the Declaration of Independence, Independence, of course, refers to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, not the Constitution. <laughs> On why he preempted the South Africa sanctions bill with an executive order of his own, he says, quote, you see, this wouldn't have been necessary if I had had what a president should have, which is a line-item veto. I could have signed the bill and line-item vetoed out the other stuff. Of course, all the line-item bills pending in Congress refer only to appropriations bill, not laws uh, affecting or executive orders affecting foreign affairs, so that's something completely removed. Uh, Reagan asked if he were aware of the Nazi SS massacre of the re residents of the French village of Oradour. He says, quote, Yes, I know all the bad things that happened in that war. I was in uniform for four years myself, unquote. Uh, <laughs> they say in costume is more like it. Reagan spent World War II making Army Air Corps training films at Hal Roach Studios in Hollywood. Another one about abortion. He says, I think the fact that children have been born even down to the three-month stage and have lived, the record shows, <laughs> to become normal human beings. Dr. Douglas Richardson, Harvard Medical School, says that the survival of a three-month fetus would be, quote, physiologically impossible. Survival of an infant born even at 23 and a half weeks, which is five and a half or six months, is exceedingly rare, almost unprecedented. But facts never got in Ron's way. It's always interesting to see how public access is presented in the mainstream media. In early April, ABC had a long segment on public access where the three examples they chose to illustrate what public access was all about was the Ku Klux Klan show, Race and Reason, a motorcycle biker show, and then a show for uh, wife swapping, where <laughs> husbands and wives who wanted to uh, trade off with other couples would show their wares on this uh, show and solicit uh, like-minded uh, swappers. That must have been in New York City, huh? <laughs> this uh, was somewhere out in California. Oh, really? California. Of course. Well, yeah. there was a story just today, April the 14th, in the New York Times, a look behind the scenes at public access television that reported on public access in uh, New York. The examples they gave of, a, of public access shows there were um, a doctor who gives out uh, medical advice to uh, callers and then a uh, would-be Frank Sinatra who plays uh, Come Fly With Me on a barroom uh, piano to the uh, great delight of uh, the New York City um, audience. Um, and then uh, Rapid T. Uh, Rabbit, a uh, puppet who someone presents as a uh, character on a show who is supposedly a figure who lives in the New York City uh, subways. This is interesting because in New York, not only is there alternative views on there as a weekly uh, program, but um, Paper Tiger TV has been on for years in New York City that does media critique. There's a weekly uh, Nicaragua show that reports on events from Latin America. There's a weekly report about events in uh, Northern Ireland by a political group there, as well as many other serious shows, but they never mention oh, those no. when they report on access. Moreover, listen to this. This is from the New York Times um, story about public access. Most producers, not surprisingly, hope to be discovered. This is why we're doing this, so we'll be <laughs> discovered by the networks. <laughs> They all respect the tale of a California woman who reviewed restaurants on a public access channel and was invited to appear with Johnny Carson. Oh, wow. Or they tell of Astario, the psychic on Manhattan Cable, who can, see be, who can be seen periodically on Late Night with David Letterman. Mm. But the moral of such stories lies not so much in their happy endings as in the fact that they are the only two examples that anyone can think of. So much for public access TV. <laughs> I'm holding out for Merv Griffin myself. Yeah. That's alternative views for this time. Please join us next time. We'd like to thank our camera person, Eric Eubank, our audio man, Kevin L. West, and of course, Austin Community Television. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713.